you you are well known uh, for your uh, well let's say not a criticism but uh, a completion of the Darwin idea of uh, natural selection with the idea of order of mm -hmm. anti chaos as yes. you called it right so if you can tell us something about this and also about the pre-adaptation idea okay uh, I'll, I'll begin by saying that uh, that 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 mostly what I've talked about here at this meeting has not been the work on spontaneous order. So I'll just say a little bit about it, although I've worked on it for 40 years. So um, first of all, I'm a, I too am a Darwinian. I think Darwin's idea of natural selection, uh, of heritable variation, is one of the profound ideas in science. Um, in fact, I, I'm thinking it's more and more and more profound as I think more and more about it. But, but as a young man, I began by wondering how much of the order do we, that we see in biology is due to self-organization and how much is due to selection. And the only other person who really thought about that before me was uh, Darcy Thompson, uh, who wrote, of course, the great book on growth and form. So the work that I started doing concerned uh, s the process of cell differentiation. So the fertilized egg the zygote, um, uh, divides a about 50 times to make all of, the, all of the cells in you when you're a baby. And the cells become different from one another. You get liver cells and kidney cells and spleen cells and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, it's known that different cell types express or make the proteins from different genes. So red cells make hemoglobin and white cells make antibody molecules, okay? Yeah. The question is how? Well, in the 1960s, Jacob and Minot, two uh, later Nobel laureate French biologists, showed that genes make proteins that turn other genes on or off. So there's some kind of genetic circuitry of genes turning one another on and off via their products mm -hmm. uh, in all of the cells of your body, each of which has exactly the same genetic network as far as we know, okay? With minor exceptions in immune cells. So, so um, wh what I wondered about was the following. If I, make, if I were to make a network of genes and model them very simply, just as if they were light bulbs, on and off, mm -hmm. um, and then just make classes of networks, would I find classes of networks or ensembles of networks that behaved in a biologic-like way with spontaneous order, mm -hmm. or would it be the case that to get the kind of order one sees in biology, one has to have extremely rare, extremely special mm. networks among the genes? Mm. So that was my question. Mm. So to do it, what I did is made, I invented what are called random Boolean nets. Mm. Um, and I made, I made networks with 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 light bulb genes. Mm. And I just tuned the number of inputs among the genes so that a gene might have one input from some gene, or it might have two inputs, or ten inputs, uh, or a thousand inputs. Mm -hmm. And then to describe the behavior of the gene, I assigned it a logical function, like or or and, uh, which are called Boolean functions, mm -hmm. hence the phrase Boolean nets. And in order to find out what the typical behavior of members of a class was, I built my networks at random, and then fixed the connections and the logic, okay? And what I did, in fact, find um, was profound spontaneous order. I wound up calling it order for free mm -hmm. in networks with only a few inputs per light bulb, you know, up to, up to two. Or if you have more than two inputs per light bulb, if you put biases on the Boolean functions, y you get extraordinary order, even in randomly built networks with thousands and thousands of genes. Mm -hmm. So I have believed for years that um, that order in biology has two sources, self-organization and selection. And I've written a lot about it. So a, a convenient book to read is my second book, At Home in the Universe. Yeah, yeah. At Home in the Universe, I know okay, Oxford University Press. Um, two, three major features from that work are the following. That such networks constrain the joint activity of the genes. Mm -hmm. to settle down into stable patterns of gene activity, mm -hmm. but distinct stable patterns of activity are possible. 
rather like a mountainous region with many lakes, and each lake drains a bunch of streams that flow into it. Mm -hmm. And these lakes are these stable patterns of gene activities, and they're called attractors. Okay, okay. so I have believed since I was 24, and I'm almost 70, oh. um, that cell types are attractors, and there's now evidence, it's finally coming out, that, that cell types really are attractors in the state space of the activity of thousands of genes measured with gene arrays. So and I believe that. M meanwhile, in about 1986, three of us independently discovered a phase transition between what we call the ordered regime and the chaotic regime, mm -hmm. which we call the edge of chaos or criticality. Chris Langton deserves a lot of credit for this. This was his PhD thesis. Mm -hmm. Independently, I discovered the same thing, and Norman Packard did too. So I have wanted to believe since then that cells are critical. Um, and we've done a lot of work showing some magical things that I'll come back to in a second. But meanwhile, in the last year and a half to two years, the first evidence has come out that genetic regulatory networks may really be critical, mm -hmm. and the brain may really be dynamically critical, too. And the, um, the reasons are, are very interesting. It turns out that critical networks can store the most information, mm -hmm. they can transfer information the best, and they can correlate the behavior of variables that change in time the best. They can resist mutations the best. They can evolve the best. So they're a very interesting class of systems.